It's Tuesday, May 31st, and this is now on HNN. Feel our heart and be strong. Uvalde grieves, saying goodbye to those lost in last week's mass shooting at visitations and funerals. Very somber, quiet, heartfelt. This is kind of a scary place to be, actually. The USA should stand with Taiwan. A U.S. congressional delegation makes a surprise visit to Taiwan, and there's a Hawaii connection. And hi, we're BTS. K-pop supergroup BTS is using its popularity and platform to address anti-Asian violence. I'm Elise Preston with what advocates say must be done to support the AAPI community. We got all these stories, plus a severe weather update on the first hurricane in the Pacific this year. Details coming up on This Is Now. Good afternoon. Thanks for watching. This is now we got Mark Carpenter sitting in for Ashley. Want to get started with this. We have a live picture coming in from Uvalde, Texas, as a community really is in mourning there at this memorial set up outside the scene of last week's mass shooting that killed so many. And they are grieving the loss of those loved ones as services continue today. And this comes as calls across the country for gun reform legislation are growing louder. Chris Pallone reports from Washington, D.C. A week after a gunman killed 21 people in a Texas school calls for the president and members of Congress to take action to prevent the next massacre continue to resonate across the country. This is a national crisis and we have not been attacking this as a national crisis. President Biden agrees. I've been to more mass shooting aftermaths than I think any president of American history, unfortunately. Thursday, the House Judiciary Committee will review a package of gun safety measures ranging from raising the legal age to buy assault rifles to mandating the safe storage of guns. But even if that bill passed the Democratic-controlled House, it would likely fail to win significant Republican support in the Senate. That's why a group of senators is looking for areas where Democrats and Republicans do agree. Progress that is going to save lives right now, and I believe that we can get that done. Possible areas of compromise, enacting red flag laws nationwide, increasing mental health resources, making schools more secure, and tightening the background check process for gun purchases. We're getting back at it next week and hope to have some results. Critics say lawmakers need to think bigger. Making small changes for gigantic problems, uh, those things are just not going to save the next fourth grader who's in line of sight of an AR-15. In Uvalde, even the local Catholic Archbishop is calling for radical gun control. We have made gun an idol in this country. The pressure is on. Will lawmakers deliver? Despite being on recess, that bipartisan Senate group has met twice already and has another meeting scheduled for tomorrow. President Biden said today he'd be willing to meet with that Senate group to help with negotiations. In Washington, Chris Palum, NBC News. Meanwhile, an Oahu church group is planning to send lay to people of Uvalde, Texas. The Light of the World Ministries in Honolulu is accepting donations of prepared tea leaves and volunteers who want to pitch in from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. through Thursday. They call their gift a lay of aloha. The three men arrested after last Thursday's shooting near Thomas Square are no longer in police custody. Two people were seriously hurt when gunfire erupted after a graduation ceremony at the Blaisdell. HPD arrested 21-year-old Kalijah Maleko and 18-year-old Tony Paleofe for attempted murder. They've both been released pending investigation. 18-year-old Capineta Ito was also arrested for assault. He posted bail. A 15-year-old was also arrested, but police did not release information on minors. And we have some developing news from the Asia Pacific. China is not happy with a surprise U.S. delegation visit to Taiwan. We got Sammy Salina standing by with those details. Taiwan announced today that it's planning cooperation between its defense forces and the U.S. National Guard. Despite it being previously reported that the Hawaii National Guard could be involved, we checked in with officials and they said that although the National Guard met with them sometimes in the past, COVID canceled some of the recent meetings. Nothing is being planned for the near future between the Hawaii National Guard and Taiwanese troops. 
The visit was led by U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth, a war hero originally from Hawaii, and was aimed at boosting relations between the U.S. and Taiwan, which China claims as its own. Duckworth was one of the main sponsors of the Taiwan Partnership Act. It received bipartisan support in the U.S. Congress, but has yet to become law. The senator said there was a lot of support for the island from U.S. lawmakers. I will close by saying that there is tremendous support for Taiwan within the legislative branch. Um, our president um, has shown his support for Taiwan. You've heard from our military, and as a member of the legislative branch, I will tell you it is a bipartisan agreement um, that the USA should stand with Taiwan. The visit comes after U.S. President Joe Biden's trip to the region. It angered China by appearing to signal a change in U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity on Taiwan by saying the U.S. would get involved militarily if China were to attack the island. In other news from the Asia-Pacific, South Korea is planning to send its largest ever fleet to Hawaii for the upcoming RIMPAC exercise. The country's largest warship, submarine, and about a thousand sailors are set to depart today. They're also sending a one-star South Korean officer, the highest rank ever, to attend the drills. Analysts say it's a noticeable change, sending a message that our countries are strengthening their security alliance. RIMPAC runs from June 29th to May 4th. Sammy Solina, Hawaii News Now. But Vicky Cayetano has filed her nomination papers this morning in her bid for governor. She made it official at the Office of Elections in Pearl City. The former First Lady is running against Lieutenant Governor Josh Green and Congressman Kai Kahele. The primary election is set for Saturday, August 13th. In his final months in office, Governor David Ige faces a decision that will affect future governors in times of crisis. He has to decide whether to veto a bill to allow state lawmakers to curb a governor's emergency powers. Rick Desog reports. They're taking away our rights. That's what it's about, taking away our freedom. During the heat of the, of the whole COVID pandemic, there was a lot of frustration out there in the community. Governor David Ige issued his first emergency proclamation on March 4, 2020 for 60 days. He went on to extend the time period a total of 14 times over a two-year period. State lawmakers decided to limit the governor's ability to extend an emergency endlessly. They passed a bill this year that would allow the legislature by two-thirds vote to terminate the governor's emergency powers after 60 days. It doesn't allow the, the governor absolute control during an emergency. So if, if people feel that the administration has gone too far and uh, maybe has had a too heavy of a hand on, on the situation, the legislature can, can put a check on it. But civil rights attorney James Hochberg, who has filed a legal challenge to the governor's emergency powers, says the bill doesn't go far enough. His suit argued that Hawaii law only allows the governor's emergency powers to remain in place for 60 days. He added that the legislature could have stepped in to end the emergency period, but didn't. It was pretty clear from the massive continuing protests that people didn't agree. But because it was a governor using executive power, they had no voice. However, a state judge disagreed with the lawsuit upholding the governor's extensions. My understanding is um, during the pandemic, he did have the legal right to do that. There wasn't any limitation um, prior to the passage of this bill for the governor to continue to extend and extend. This allowed him to operate pretty nimbly in you know, a constantly evolving situation. The Ige administration's adjutant general, Kenneth Hara, testified against giving the legislature the power to terminate the governor's emergency powers, saying it will, quote, reduce the efficiency and effectiveness of an ongoing emergency response. Governor Ige has until June 27th to inform the legislature if he plans to veto the bill. Rick Desog, Hawaii News Now. All right, well, we knew it was going to be a hectic travel weekend, but not quite this hectic. Thousands of flights were canceled over the Memorial Day weekend. And for more on that, we are joined live in the H&N Digital Center by Dylan Anchetta. So, Dylan, uh, really just a mess out there, huh? Yeah, guys, it was a messy one for sure. The Memorial Day holiday weekend proved to be a tough one for many airlines, with carriers canceling more than 7,000 flights worldwide, including hundreds here in the U.S. alone. On Monday, some 1,600 flights had been canceled. 
canceled by noon. That's according to flight tracking website FlightAware. That followed that was followed by roughly 1,640 cancellations on Sunday, another 1,500 on Saturday, and get this, a whopping 2,300 on Friday. More than 400 of Monday's cancellations involved aircrafts scheduled to fly to or from U.S. cities. All right, Dylan. So break it down for us. What airlines were really the ones having the problem? Yeah, it was a tough day, especially if you were traveling with Delta. Unfortunately, they canceled 133 flights. That's about 4% of their operations. And that was on Monday alone. Um, they also, the carrier was forced to scrap another 400 flights on Saturday and Sunday. And they say it's, was, it was due to bad weather and, quote, air traffic control actions. Not exactly sure what that means, but the Atlanta-based company said in an email to the Associated Press that they've been trying to give their passengers a heads up and cancel the flights at least 24 hours in advance. They also told CBS News that around 90% of their customers who had a canceled flight on Sunday were rebooked on a flight later in that day. So there's some good news, but still frustrating nonetheless. And we should note that Delta announced on its website last week that from July 1st to August 7th, it would reduce service by about 100 daily departures, primarily in parts of the U.S. and Latin America that they frequently serve. It's interesting because I dropped a friend off at the airport on Thursday and the state was warning everyone, come early, come early. Yeah. But get there three hours yeah. early. Oh, right? When we got there, it was around 1.30, no line at all. It so, was kind of a hit yeah, or miss. Yeah. We did see some videos come in of the line stretching. Right. And then we sent a crew there and they said, there's nothing here. So I think it's all about timing and just the high demand yeah. peak travel times. And the flights do come in waves. We get like a yeah. big afternoon rush of flights and there's the morning rush People well. trying to travel after pandemic frustration only to have a frustrating travel experience yeah. and one of those <laughs> elements out. you mentioned there dylan is the severe weather and it, uh, really hit the northern plains area hard this is from minnesota you can tell from the air you can see the trail of destruction a path of a suspected tornado there in a Bereda, Minnesota. It snapped trees, ripped off roofs. The county officials there say at one point get this it cut off the roads leading into the town and they even said at one point more than one million people in Minnesota were under a tornado watch. Here's even more of the latest video coming in of the destruction and I have this graphic to show you guys. This is the potential area of of storms today. Of course, the storms that hit yesterday in Minnesota, all moving to the east. Now they're stretching from Michigan to Texas. Another round of storms expected tomorrow. And that's not it. Over there in the eastern Pacific, dealing with the first hurricane of the year. This is Hurricane Agatha hit Porto and Hell, Mexico yesterday as a Category 2 storm with 105 miles per hour winds. Yikes. Strongest making landfall in the Pacific as a hurricane on record so early in the year. So we closely watch this. You guys know this. Yeah. We watch this area a lot in the Eastern Pacific. This storm moved into the Gulf and now off to the Caribbean. But the ones we worry about are the ones that go west right towards the islands and hurricane season is upon us. A it's reminder to be prepared. To yeah. definitely, now is the time to prepare, not when it's already coming. Get prepared now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, download the Severe Weather app from your H&N digital platforms and also just get your hurricane kits ready. That's for sure. Also, we're watching the surf out there and just other weather conditions. We've got to turn things over to Guy Hoggy with the latest on that. There's not going to be much in the way of rainfall anytime soon. If anything, we might get a passing splash for those Windward and Malka neighbors, mainly in the early morning and overnight hours. That's going to be happening for the next couple of days. Here's your seven-day forecast, and it's looking good, right? Lots of sunshine on tap for the duration of the forecast. Nice steady traders today, building tonight through Thursday at 15 to 20. A little breezy at time for some spots, especially windward spots. But still, we're going to see lots of sunshine, very little rain. And then the weather's going to change ever so slightly on Friday because the trade winds slow down. So they slow down significantly. And that means for the, from there into the early part of next week, humidity levels will be rising, and there's a better chance for some afternoon clouds and a few afternoon spotty showers. As we honored our fallen heroes on Memorial Day, there is one group often overlooked, the 33,000 Japanese-American soldiers who fought in World War II. Barry Peterson has their story. Kiyoshi Muranaga, Medal of Honor recipient, who forced the retreat of a German artillery gun firing at his buddies. Second Lieutenant Daniel Inoue, Medal of Honor recipient, who fought after his arm was shattered, came home to become a U.S. Senator from Hawaii. 
Both men from the 442nd Regiment, made up of Japanese Americans, one of the most decorated units in World War II. Fighting for a country that locked up many of their families as enemies of America. The memories flow when Yoshia Nakamura sees the pictures of fellow veterans at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles. Why were you willing to serve a country that, as you say, took away your rights? Well, I was willing to serve the United States government. I had a great faith that the incarceration of Japanese Americans uh, was a big mistake. 1942. 120,000 American citizens of Japanese descent on the West Coast were forced to abandon homes and sent to internment, some said concentration camps. June Aochi Burke was 10 when she went from American-born citizen to prisoner. We could not uh, leave because of the barbed wires that were around us and the guard towers with the uh, military guards looking down at us but her brother volunteered to go to war. Linda Gambo's father was drafted. He was in a camp, in the internment camp or concentration camp, and felt betrayed almost by a country that he had lived in. What do you want Americans to remember about them? We all are here for the American dream, and they gave their lives for that. They fought for peace and freedom, and we have to honor that. Men like Private First Class Sadao Munamori, Medal of Honor recipient, who threw himself on a grenade to save his friends. One of many Americans who never came back. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Denver. A USS Oklahoma sailor has finally been laid to rest at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific at Punchbowl. Navy Fire Controlman Jack Breedlove was 19 on December 7, 1941, and was one of 429 crewmen killed that day. After being declared non-recoverable in 1947, new DNA analysis allowed officials to finally identify Breedlove's remains last year. Services took place a short time ago, and a rosette will be placed next to his name on the walls of the missing to indicate he has been accounted for. New at noon, BTS visits the White House. Here's Elise Preston with what went down. Hi, we're BTS. Global K-pop supergroup BTS brought their star power to the White House to address violence against Asian Americans. We said everyone has their own history. We hope today is one step forward to respecting and understanding each and everyone as a valuable person. The seven-member group met privately with President Biden to discuss the surge in crimes, harassment, and bullying that's particularly hit Asian Americans hard during the pandemic. Shika said it's not wrong to be different. I think equality begins when we open up and embrace all of our differences. Just two weeks ago, a 68-year-old suspect opened fire on Taiwanese churchgoers in Southern California, leaving one person dead and injuring five others. A pastor hit the gunman on the head with a chair and worshipers tackled him. The issue is severe here in New York City. Hate crimes increased almost 200 percent from 2020 to 2021, the biggest spike against the Asian community. The widow of a Chinese food delivery man who was shot to death earlier this month in Queens spoke out at a press conference Tuesday. I want justice for my husband's murder. I really don't want to see another family to go through the same kind of pain. Emily Rios of Asian Americans for Equality says elderly Asians have also been at heightened risk. There is hesitation to go outside, go to their medical appointments, uh, even to go take the subway and travel to go get their groceries. The organization has opened food pantries serving seniors too afraid to take mass transit and hosted self-defense courses as the nation continues to take steps to address hate and bias. Elise Preston, CBS News, New York. All right, guys, let's see what the internet is talking about today. And Monopoly fans like myself. Here we go. Yep. Have let their voices be heard. And, you know, Hasbro was announcing that they're going to bring back a retired token, you know, the Monopoly games pieces. And there was a vote, and fans chose to bring back the thimble. They had the choices between horse and rider, wheelbarrow, iron, boot, or a money bag. 
and the classic sewing accessory won out. I played Monopoly a couple times over the pandemic. It lasted for hours, but it was a lot of fun for me because I won. Not so fun for my friends that I wouldn't like quit. <laughs> um, and get this, they're replacing my favorite token, the one I use all the time. It's one of the newest ones, the T-Rex. I see. So um, one of the things I'm wondering about, and the thimble is a fantastic choice, by Why the way. Um, but it's is, so realistic. Is the dog still <laughs> yeah. there in the car? Yeah, those are all classics. They cannot get rid of the oh, okay, car. That okay. is the piece you fight oh, over. I see. You I can't see. get rid of it. I would have voted for the horse. It's just the easiest to grab. And, oh, yeah. It yeah. looks like it's jumping. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right, Mark. What did you find? <laughs> oh, my goodness. What did I find? Now, oh, if you've yeah. tried getting a hold of a Taco Bell Mexican pizza in the last few days, you've most likely been disappointed. Now, since its return earlier this month, many locations here and across the nation have been running out. The company says restocking supplies is taking longer than expected, but they are not only working to bring the pizzas back for a short stay, they are seeking a permanent restoration wow. to the Taco Bell menu. Uh, Taco Bell is also reportedly planning a Mexican pizza musical, which is slated to run on TikTok. <laughs> are you serious? Um, not the yes, musical. Yes, that, oh, that's, my goodness. That's wow. right. Dylan and I were talking the line here locally. Yes, traffic. It's been causing traffic. So if you're near Taco Bell, go around. So <laughs> I live near the Taco Bell in Hawaii, Kai, and I have to admit that twice last week, Two nights in a row, I had Mexican pizza for dinner, so I contributed to this shortage. Oh, Real quickly, go. Dylan, what you got? <laughs> yeah, they're some of America's favorite cookies, and now they have their very own makeup line. The Girl Scouts partnered with beauty brand Hip Dot for the limited edition Hip Dot and Girl Scouts makeup collection. It features two scented eyeshadow palettes and three lipsticks, or you can, of course, get the whole collector's kit. According to the Girl Scouts website, the creators took every shade and skin type into consideration, and, of course, it's cruelty-free and vegan. So... There you go. Some new makeup cool. for you. All right. Good news now. We're going to get to that in a second. But first, I really want to get to the story everyone's talking about, and that is that vandalism of the Mona Lisa. Jeannie Mose has more on that. I've covered lots of people, like Ralph Nader, getting a pie in the face. But when the face of the Mona Lisa gets creamed, that's a different story. No way. Take it from two guys who were there in Paris's Louvre Museum. A lot of people just started gasping and like we heard some oohs and ahs. And this is the guy who admitted creaming the Mona Lisa. A man dressed as an old lady, he um, jump, um, jump out of his wheelchair. Faking being handicapped allowed him to get closer to the painting after first pounding on the bulletproof glass that covers the Mona Lisa. He literally pushed a cake on the glass. <laughs> Yeah, just straight up just smushed or smashed the cake right up on the glass. Security grabbed the suspect and the cream was quickly wiped away. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, men have named you. Celebrated in song, but why? Slapped with cake. Think of the earth. There are people who are destroying the earth, he said in French. Artists tell you, think of the earth. That's why I did this. The museum says the painting was not damaged. There were plenty of online jokes. The Mona Lisa watching as a guy approaches her with a cake. When they were done cleaning her up, the crowd applauded. <laughs> Mona Lisa have a pretty smile. I don't know why this guy did that. <laughs> but he definitely didn't manage to wipe that smile off her face. Do you smile to tempt a lover? Genie Mouse, CNN. New this York. Disaster averted. Now, finally, the world's longest glass bottom bridge is now ready to welcome visitors. The Bok Long Bridge opened over the weekend in Vietnam. It's 2,073 feet long, and its bottom is three layers of tempered glass that is 40 millimeters thick. And it is a certified Guinness World Record. Amazing. No way I'm getting on that. <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it for this is now on this Tuesday. We made it to Tuesday. Mark's back first at four. Keep checking your digital platforms forms for updates from Dylan.